Okay. So first of all, I, I want to um, give you, so I, I put uh, the lectures and also some uh, mathematical files, things like this, with the, the things that I use to produce the plots, the ones that are, you can recognize that I made from the Mathematica. I put it here. Um, Okay, HTTP, blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, um, so if you, if, you, if you want, you can look at the slides of the lectures and also these various mathematical files and things like this. Okay, so, um, so let me uh, summarize where we stand after the two lectures. So, um, so we did some calculation, or I discussed some calculations of, say, the one-loop uh, displacement power spectrum or um, density power spectrum. Um, here I just quoted, I, I, so it, um, I, I quoted the exact formula for, and this is the case for this uh, displacement potential that I discussed the other day. So you can see that then this, uh, this uh, correction to the power spectrum uh, at uh, um, momentum k is given by some integral over the other momentum q. And there are these two diagrams, the one in which uh, there is a p of k times some integral, and the other one in which the two p's are inside the integral that's called the p22. And OK, this is the specific formula. So the exercise, another exercise for you is to uh, just derive that based on this F2 and F3. So the ones that, that of you that want to to uh, pr look at this in more detail, it, I mean, this is in the literature. You can find it. Um, and it's on the basis of uh, a formula like this one that uh, what I w so so here the the integration variable is changed to be this R, which is the ratio of the internal to the external momenta, and um, these are integrals with some functions of, of these ratios, which are these F2s and F, F2 square and F3. And um, on the basis of, of that uh, kind of formula, I took the contribution to these integrals from R much smaller than 1, from R much bigger than 1. And it's on the basis of this that I was getting formulas like this, OK? So, um, so I think uh, with those, you can play around and see if you can reproduce the these coefficients and things like that. So anyhow, but the, the discussion that we had yesterday was that uh, when you look at this, uh, so, so it, it was a discussion about um, this, the, the sensitivity of these calculations to the, um, to the high momenta in the integral. And uh, starting with the, the point that we discussed, that uh, this perturbation theory is not uh, expected or we know it does not uh, um, converge to the right result at, uh, at, uh, for high momenta. Now, when you write these uh, integrals, there's integrals from in, in the loop. They're going through over all of the momenta. And so clearly, part of the answer depends on things that you are they're not uh, necessarily correct. And so this is just an example of um, so so this is ju just to, to give you a sense. For example, the, this is the deep. So let, let's say that just to understand more or less what's going on, um, let's take the, this P22 and P13 and think about how much the answer depends on the cutoff, the UV cutoff of the integral, just to have a sense. So these are the comparisons between the answer when you put the cutoff infinity to when you put the cutoff around uh, 0.6, K of 0.6, just to have some sense, OK? And you can see that the, this one is for P22, the relative uh, change, and this is uh, for P13. P22, in all the range of scales that we care about around here, it almost doesn't depend at all on the cutoff. So that one, um, OK, that, just to know. This. The other one, you can see that uh, y you know, even at this kind of scales, the, there are differences of, uh, of 5 to 10%. Okay, so this 
at least at the one loop, that's the, on, on this range of scales, that's kind of a sense, this gives you a sense of how, how uh, um, much your answer actually is depending on, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on, 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 on the part of the integral that where you know you're, do, you're making a mistake. So probably the answer is, the, so at the few percent level, you know this part of the integral is wrong here, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. Um, but we also discussed yesterday that as you, as, you, um, as you try to make better and better approximations going to higher and higher loops, um, the, the integrals become more and more, or some of them, some of these diagrams become more and more UV sensitive and related to this uh, question was, for example, when, now when you compute one of the two loop terms, this is all for the displacement, but similar stories can be said about the, the density power spectrum. Uh, the, this P15, which is a two loop term, is super big as well, or uh, much bigger than you might naively expect. And I also showed you um, the integrand of, uh, that, that went into the P13 and, the, and, 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 and uh, more or less an estimate of the integrand that would go into the calculation of P15. The, the one that went into P13 that leads to these few percent or five or 10 percent. Um, dependence on the cutoff for P13 is the dashed line. And you can see the integral, uh, you know, the, the, the curve goes down. And so if, if this is in log log, so it doesn't look like it goes down as much, but, but it, it, it's a lot, right? Uh, so when you, when you change the cutoff, you, somewhere around here, the answer, what you're putting into the integral um, is not clear what it is. And so, but, but it's a small fraction because the thing is decaying. But if you look at P15, you know, it's dominated for, at high moment, and so a lot of it is coming from the place where you're, you're making uh, a mistake. So, and, and this gets progressively worse as you go forward. So I, I guess the summary then was that uh, uh, we know that if you solve this, so these are all kind of obvious things. Uh, so um, the, uh, if you solve these equations in perturbation theory, they do not, on small scales, you don't, they're not even converge to the right answer. There is not a question of not having added enough terms or anything. It's just not going to happen. The loops, um, the loops, uh, you know, in the loop runs contributions or, or contribute things on those scales. And as a result, there's always a part of your answer that is kind of wrong. The, the, that is, at least the, the, that, how much that is depends on the power spectrum of the initial conditions. For our universe, at one loop, is a few percent uh, correction just uh, at this and this in this displacement thing, um, and it gets more and more as you go to higher loops. Um, but on the other hand, uh, just to the, the the other intuition that I gave you was that um, it's not that uh, even though you might not have uh, control of what happens on small scales, in in actual fact, what happens is that things stick together, and so. It, um, should not be a terrible problem. Things are not going to fly away and affect really very large scales. On the contrary, it's going to be rather better than you hope. Uh, so now, let's, what I want to do now is discuss how, how to fix this. Um, um, and so, so here, there is a lot of literature now. Uh, you should look, uh, for example, so people that have been working on, uh, on uh, these things a lot are Leonardo Senatore and, 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 and his group, uh, Enrico Pacher. Then you can look for me, or also Merdad Mirmavalle or Marco Simonovic. There are a lot of people. Tobias Baldov, these are people that are now at the IA. So search for any of them, and, and you will find uh, um, a lot of uh, calculations and derivations of things. So. Uh, I will, I will, um, and, and so le let me just say first, um, roughly speaking, what, uh, what's going to happen, and then I will derive it in more detail. So, um, so, so clearly, so once you see this, you, you realize that you, you must be doing something wrong, um, or you should, you should try to, um, to, to correct this problem. The obvious way of correcting this problem has to be that, uh, um, the, okay, a practical way would be in, if you're doing these loop integrals, you should cut them off somewhere, okay? 
but at least in the, in the place where you think the corrections that you are putting are more or less correct. But on the other hand, there will be some effect of the, of the scales that you are now not putting at all, that you don't know what it is. So this, uh, this uh, fixing of the problem will involve also some sort of free parameters, right? Because um, this theory does not allow you to predict what is happening on small scales. So the question is, the, the effects from the small scales, how they will, uh, you know, how, try to keep track of them, okay? It's try to only maybe include in these integrals um, uh, the part that, you, that, that, that is correct, or only trust that part, and the part that uh, is incorrect, you have to take it out and replace it for something that is uh, describing the, the, the actual dynamics. That something is not, some, is not you cannot compute it, so you, it will involve some sort of free parameters. In, in, in practice, what people have done is, um, you can imagine the following. So uh, basically, um, a, a strategy to try to figure out what you think uh, um, and, and um, how, to, how to modify the equation. So, uh, so I'm now telling you there should be some sort of free parameters to account for the, for, for the dynamics of the scales that these equations are not getting correct. Um, but the equations that, that I had I didn't have any free parameters. So somehow I need to find my theory needs to be a different one, uh, which has some sort of free parameters that allow me to in encode into, into there um, the, the, the effects of the small scale. So one option to try to derive such, such equations would be the following. So um, the, the reason why this is not working is because of the small scales, right? And so one option is to right now decide, okay, I'm not going to try to even describe the small scale at all. I'm only going to talk about uh, things on the large scale. So I'm, I'm going to try to uh, find equations for smooth variables. So somehow first smooth the variables on some large scale, some, let's define the, some cut of lambda, I smooth everything on this cut of lambda, and not now try to find the, the uh, say I have the equations for, for all these particles in the numerical simulation, and then I first average over a big, so let's say I have my volume of the numerical simulation or the universe, you know, rather than, and it's filled with these particles, rather than, uh, so now we are, we are pretending that we are solving the, 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 the equation for all the particles, and that, uh, um, that uh, led us to some trouble. So let's, before, uh, before we even start solving these equations, let's group these particles into big mega particles such that now what is left there is just the universe only on very large scales where it hasn't had time to collapse or anything, and then I'm going to just then follow the dynamics of the big particles in this universe. But now these big particles have a size, okay? So have some size, L is one over lambda. And as a result, for example, if there's a gravitational, if, this, if these particles have a quadrupole moment and there is some gravitational potential, they will move slightly differently in the gravitational potential because the quadrupole will there's a force to do with the quadrupole, or they will source gravity in a different way. In other words, what I'm telling you is that if you want to get away uh, uh, from, from the problems of the small scales by completely having a theory that doesn't talk at all about the small scales and always talks about big regions, just the dynamics of big regions, and I'm not even going to look inside what it is, um, in a, if, if these regions are big, well, they, will, they are big, so they will have a quadrupole moment, they will have multiple moments that are important for their dynamics. They will get deformed, they are not going to be spheres. As, as, as time goes by, they will get deformed, okay? And so I will need to track all of that down, and, and, uh, and so basically I would need to, to solve the equations not for, um, not for a bunch of point particles, but a bunch of large particles that have multiple moments. So let's say a quadrupole, an octopole, and whatever. And so those quadrupoles are the things that I don't know, that I cannot compute, because they depend on the small scale dynamics, OK? So the free parameters will be things about the properties of the quadrupole, OK? So in other words, I change this, the theory that I'm working on to be the theory of extended objects moving around. And then 
the properties of its multiple moments I, is the part that I cannot compute and I will have to model with some free parameters. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Another way of, uh, this is called uh, Lagrangian effective theory of large scale structure. Um, if, you, if you start thinking about particles like this, um, and another option is to say, um, following what people were, were asking me yesterday, now if, if you think about what's happening with all these particles in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the universe and in the simulation, um, we, were, we were modeling them as uh, some fluid with zero, so say for the, there was a fluid at one velocity at each point in space, one density, things were moving around, but eventually the, 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 there become streams of particles that cross each other, so it's no longer a fluid, right? There's like multiple uh, streams in, in each location, so there's, so rather than in each point in space being only one velocity, there are some particles that are going in one direction, some particles that are going in the other direction. There's a distribution function of these particles. So if you were to compute the stress tensor of something like this, now, in a sense, if you smooth over some big region, there is some sort of effective pressure in the sense that things are moving around like the molecules of a gas, right? So you, sh you could think that now uh, the, a way to fix this is to uh, not solve the equations uh, for just a pressureless fluid, but uh, a fluid which has an additional stress tensor like with a pressure. It, this is not going to be isotropic in space, so it might have also not just pressure, but anyway, so add some sort of stress tensor to the equations, and again, the stress tensor um, is to do with the small scale stuff that you don't know exactly what it is, and so in 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 writing what what this might be, there will be free parameters, just that there are these quadruples here and so on. So so you generalize your you generalize your theory to because you 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 think that you're now solving uh, you you're, you're smoothing you're coarse graining the situation, and in that in that case the this this uh, fluid now no longer uh, is uh, just a perfect fluid, but it has uh, some pressure or some, uh, so, okay, anyway, so, so this is, uh, you, you start thinking in this direction and you end up with this Eulerian effective theory of for large scale structure. So somehow we, 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 we change the equations, we change the problem, there will be some free parameters to describe the small scales and then, uh, and then once you solve those equations, these free parameters can be used to to fix these UV problems. Uh, in other words, for example, um, okay, so I, I, I'll tell you in, in, in a little while in more precise. So that, that, that's what you would find in those papers, and so I will, I will now do it in a slightly different way so that it's, um, so that, so, so that it's, it, it's a different, you, you have a third or a, a, different, a different way of, 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 of doing it. It's not so different than this, but I will, I will, um, I will be like more, um, more um, concrete in some sense. So I'll start by looking at this picture and uh, forget about uh, anything and I will say, okay, I, I, I look at what's happening in the simulation and my perturbation theory and so on. For example, I look at the picture there and I realized the following. So, um, so in, in the top panel, what, what, what you see in the red dots are, are the positions of the particles in, in, uh, in, the, in a numerical simulation, and the, the rods are connect the, the, the position of the particle in the numerical simulation to the position of the particle in perturbation theory. Seldovich approximation, second order Lagrangian perturbation theory. So what you notice, uh, so the conclusion uh, that we discussed yesterday was that um, this displacement, okay, so let me think, there's some displacement that the, the particles actually make, okay? Let's, let's take that the numerical simulation is the truth. So that's the displacement of the numerical simulation. The, the perturbation theory one, it's, it's okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, giving you something. So if you look at the top picture, indeed, things you know, are clustering. In the, so it's not, a, it's not a random thing. It's OK. Uh, it, it looks reasonable. But however, things don't end up perfectly in the, in the correct uh, place. They end up close 
nearby, okay? Like, for example, if you look at this around a specific halo, you can see, you know, the blue points are, are wherever they should end up. Uh, the circles are the virial radius and twice the virial radius of this uh, halo, but they are around there, but they are not uh, perfect to where they need to be. And, and the point is that even if, if, if I start doing perturbation theory to more and more, um, um, more orders, it doesn't get any better. Okay? It's not that this is a question of, uh, okay, you stop that second order. In fact, it gets even worse as you go higher order because of this fact that S, the, the, the higher, they, they become more and more UV, so they overdo it. And it it's bad. But, um, um, but, okay, so this perturbation theory gives you something, but there's always a mistake, okay? So, um, so there's some error, okay? That depends on the particles. So that's what's happening, and no matter how, how much, uh, how much um, um, I do more loops or whatever I do, I'm not going to get rid of this error. Okay, there, I will change, it, the error will be different. Uh, if you put more, it will change what the error you're making, but you're always ma making some error, okay? So what I will do now is uh, track the, the effect of this error as, uh, as uh, I move along, okay? See, see, see what the effect of this error is, okay? Is it, is it any questions? No? So, so um, let me compute the density, okay? Density would be the, the, the sum over all the particles of uh, delta function of x minus q plus s, where s is the, the I'm, I'm going to compute the real density, okay? And I'm going to say, my, my question is, if I've computed this, but there is this error, wh what is the relation between the true density that I compute with this to the density that I compute using the perturbation theory. The fact that there is this error, how does it affect the density that we'll compute on, the, on different scales? That's the question that I want to ask. And so this is the formula for the density. Let me go to Fourier space, okay? So if, if, I, if I go to, to Fourier space, I end up with the following. And now there's two S's. Let me just say S perturbation theory plus S uh, mistake. Let me just change it to M only because, or error, E, I don't know. Okay, so there, there is this. So now I want to see what's the effect of, of this error. And uh, um, in, in a little while I will show you the, um, I will show you the, the, the size of this, uh, of this error and, and um, you will see that in many, for, for if you go, so if you go to sufficient, or let me say it the other way around, if you go to sufficiently low k, this error is not going to be very, very big, or k times the error is not going to be very big. And so let me, for starters, just expand in, the, in, the, um, in this error, okay? So this will be in the, ju ju just to do something, okay? Th th then we will see how, but l l I want to get a sense of what's going on, okay? So I will get one plus I K S error plus one half or minus one half K I K J S I error S J error. Okay, dot 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 dot. Okay, and so what I should have said what what are the properties of this error or what the first property of this error that I'm making is that so so it's something uncorrelated with the perturbation theory. So it's some, some mistake that has, is, is whatever is not in the perturbation theory. So let me just say that this S error and the S perturbation theory, they are uncorrelated. Okay, let me start with, with that. The, if you, you can take it as, as in, in, in the end you will see this is more or less a, a definition of this S error. Um, and so now I have, this is my, this is delta, okay? And what I want to do now is to compute the, the correlation function or the power spectrum of delta, okay? If there wasn't this, it would be delta of perturbation theory, right? This is delta of perturbation theory. This induces some corrections, okay? So uh, I would want to see how big those, or w w what is the form of those corrections. 
And so I, I want to compute delta of k, the, the power spectrum. OK, let, let me just uh, take out the 2 pi cube delta function. Forget about that. So, um, so um, I, I want to compute that. So, so, so the, and let me just do it at the lowest order in, in, uh, in S error, OK? So now I have two options. S, so delta starts with delta perturbation theory. Then there is this correction. Then there is this other correction, OK? I'm going to compute this to the lowest order in, uh, in, um, in S error. So, in, so let me just also start with something like this. S error, I will just take it to be some sort of, uh, well, component i, component j. Would, let me just start with this. I, I will describe it. So it's some sort of random error with size sigma error squared, OK? Uh, which, if you look at this plot, is the scatter of these points, OK? There's, these points are moving around. They scatter, let me say, they scatter randomly with some error, OK? So, um, so if you take, so now we, we can do the following thing. I can take the, so when I, com when I will compute the power spectrum here, I have two options, two terms, OK, or three. One in which I put nothing to do with the error, and that gives me the, the, the perturbation theory power spectrum, OK? But then I have two options, one in which I take this linear term times another linear term, 2s is one, one in here and one in there, OK? Or the one in which I take this term in one of them and nothing on the other, OK? So let me focus on that particular term for starters. So this is basically, for that kind of term, what I'm doing is taking the average of this delta um, on one of them, on, the, on one of the sides, and then I will correlate that with the, with the other one, right? So I just take this delta for that term. So this it would be the term 2. Or I don't know. The, the, the quadratic times uh, zeroth order, OK? That term. So I'm, on the one side, I do a quadratic term in, in sigma. On the other side, I do the zeroth order one. So then when I, ta and I take expectation value first over the error only, over the, over the S error. And I leave, I don't take yet expectation value over the perturbation theory, OK? So if I do that, so I, take, I can take the expectation value on, the, on this one side, so the delta quadratic expectation value of this over the error one. For, for a fix, uh, I, I, the, the perturbation theory one, I, I leave it without yet taking the, the, the uh, expectation value. So I get the following. So, and then I get the one, and then I get some sort of minus k squared sigma error squared over two or something. Dot, 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 dot. OK? So, so um, is, it, is this clear or not? Yeah? Um, at this point, it's an assumption. And at, at a later point, it will become the definition of S error. But at this point, let me just, uh, let me just um, um, take it as an assumption. And we, uh, I, I, we'll see in a second, OK? Um, yeah, this, this, uh, both of these things are questionable. And uh, I will fix some of them in a second, OK? Or both of them. Um, but um, but the, 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 physic, the, the picture I have in mind is, is this picture, OK? I more or less go to the right place. And then let's say that what's happening, I'm trying to describe what's happening here. And let me just model it at the very beginning as saying things more or less go where perturbation theory tells them to go. And then I add some random error. That's my 
first p physical picture, okay? The reason why I'm going, to, I'm going to take that this error is, is uncorrelated with the perturbation theory is the following. If in reality the error was, uh, was not uncorrelated, it would mean, for example, that, uh, let's say an example would be that perturbation theory tells you to go there, and uh, in reality you should only should go 10% uh, less than where perturbation theory tells you. So instead of being S perturbation theory is 0 0.9 of perturbation theory. That was, if the error was this, then I would correct. I would, what I will end up doing is call perturbation theory, you know, fix this and say, oh, the new perturbation theory has here some co co coefficient that I will use it to fix this, okay? I will redefine my perturbation theory. So, and this is what is going to happen in some sense when you, when you make this, you will find two kind of uh, corrections. One correction in which you take the perturbation theory and you fix it a little bit, and another part which you have no idea. It's a complete random thing that, that, uh, that, um, 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 that uh, you, know, you, you, you cannot predict. So, so another way to have in mind is to ask the following question. Imagine I have that simulation box, okay? They told me the initial conditions, and I want to use this perturbation theory to know where the particles are going to be. So there is a part of the motion of the particles that I will end up being able to calculate based on the perturbation theory. It will be those perturbation theory formulas, perhaps corrected by a little bit. For example, I will find that I need to multiply some of these things by 1 minus k squared, sigma squared, stuff like this. I will correct them in some way. But there are things that I can compute that are not a random thing, a noise that I don't know what to do. But in addition to that, there will be a piece which I don't know in any given realization the error what is going to be, okay? That's, that is really this part, okay? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, good. These are all of these other things that, uh, that I will fix later, okay? But now, first of all, if, if, the, if the error is some sort of random error that uh, is not dependent on, so by, by uh, homogeneity and isotropy, there cannot be any, spe any special direction. This thing has to be the same everywhere. So that's what fixes this. But that's too quick because I'm taking this expectation value for a fixed perturbation theory. So I'm saying, imagine there was this uh, box of the, of, of the simulation, and there was a long way, a mode like that. Um, it could well be that the error that I make here and the error that I make there is different. So it might be that this error depends on what the value of the modes that I am describing in that point is. So I will have to fix that for that purpose in the next step. But if I forget about, if I'm not asking about the dependence of, of these things on the long mode, then everywhere is the same, and so th there's no preferred direction, no preferred position, it has to be like this, okay? So this would be, this is the simple example in which on top of perturbation theory, I write some random error. In fact, I think, or in, what happens is not this, is that the, you have some error, but it's not completely random. In statistical properties, depends on where you are. So I will need to correct this formula to account for this. But, okay, I, I, I'm doing it slowly. Um, okay, so, um, good, so, so, so I get something like that. Um, um, and, then, uh, and then there is the linear term. Let me talk about the linear term in just a second, okay? So, um, but now imagine, uh, well, you, you, you can see, you can see, um, so, so now if you take this, what, this, this stuff is the delta that you would compute in perturbation theory. If, there was no correction. So now you've just found that the delta that you actually get, at least for, for this piece, is just the delta of perturbation theory, which is, this, in, this can come out of the integral, one minus k squared, sigma error squared, dot, 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 okay? So, um, 
So already this tells you that um, the overdensity that you will measure in the simulation in the presence of this error is not the one that you compute in perturbation theory, but it's corrected in this way, OK? So this tells you, and uh, so, and, and it's some, it has, so, yeah, OK. So, so if you measure the density, it will look like this. It will not look like the perturbation theory one. So this, um, um, and, and this is very much related. This is exactly what I was telling you before, that perhaps the perturbation theory, I should fix it. And from now on, rather than say that perturbation theory is, is uh, going to give you this, it now gives you that, OK? So now I have my free parameter. So OK, so this pretty much is the whole story. I will fix it a little bit. But so sigma, the error is something I don't know what it is, OK? It's my free parameter, OK? So from here, you see that when I look at the picture in the simulation, the Fourier modes of the, uh, in, in the picture will be these ones corrected in this way with a free parameter that exactly encodes the small scale motions that I'm not able to compute, OK? Um, and, uh, and so this will be my new perturbation theory, OK, with the free parameter. Now, you can see from here that you are not free to, uh, to um, put whatever you want here, for example. This thing needs to start with k squared because each each error that you make comes with a k, OK? So if you're going to talk about a sigma square there, it needs to have a k square. So if you just look from here, there are certain rules as to what's the form of, uh, of these possible corrections from the unknown, OK? This is the unknown. Possible corrections from the unknown cannot be anything. They come in specified forms, OK? And the whole point of these papers is to figure out what are those possible forms. And the lowest order of those forms is exactly this one, OK? Um, now, uh, next thing to say is the following. So, um, well, I'll, I will say the next thing later. Let, let me, let me um, OK, so let me fix some of the, or, or tell you about some of the things that I, um, uh, that I, um, OK, good. So let me answer Merdat's question, OK? So now, from, from um, good. So um, imagine the following. Now, imagine I'm going to, um, Let, 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 let me, let me um, uh, perhaps I should answer my dad's question later, one step later. But I can, I can do a version of, of my dad's question about whether the, this assumption, whether it was an assumption or not an assumption, OK? Let me ask the question about the correlation between the delta that I compute in perturbation theory and the delta of the error, OK? So uh, now, what is the full delta? In th that we've just computed. OK, the full delta has then two pieces. One piece, which is the one that I had. So I took this expectation value of this term. I'm missing this term. OK, so it will be 1 minus k square sigma error square dot, 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 delta perturbation theory of k. OK, and then there is this term over here. Let me, for simplicity, just uh, you can do better, but for the purpose of this, you, you can just, uh, when I keep this term, let me just put this to as, as if this was uh, expand also in, in the perturbation theory and keep the lowest term where that only has the error, okay? Just to have some formula I can write down, I will replace as if SPD was zero, okay? Do perturbation theory on that, but that, that's not, but just so that I can write something here. So this would be minus the, or, or plus i k uh, s error of k. Okay. If I just just to find something, if I if I put uh, if I put this here, then this is just the Fourier transform of s of e, e error, and so it becomes i k and s error of k. Okay. So this is the formula. Okay. 
Um, so then there are two pieces for the. So there's 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 a piece that uh, that um, 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 that 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 is just a correction on the perturbation theory, and then there's some some random thing extra. And now, in some sense, you can uh, you you can. So it depends on what you call the error. If you call the error the k square delta perturbation theory plus this, if this is the error, part of the error is correlated with, uh, with the perturbation theory. Part of the error is just proportional to what you had before. But if I, um, but, but I, will, I will, for the most part, always say, always think of the, this whole thing as the perturbation theory, and now the error will be uncorrelated with, with that, okay? I'm, that's kind of the definition. Anything that looks like the perturbation theory, I will move it to this side by correcting something. And so by, per, by definition, this guy is the part that is not, you know, uh, perturbation theory, anything that looks like perturbation theory, okay? So, um, Good. So, so this is the new. This is the new. Um, the, 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 what the new theory tells me that I should do. Okay. So um, now let me fix another thing. So, uh, as as uh, you were asking me, what about uh, what about um, the fa what about this assumption? Okay. So yeah, I should relax that assumption. So um, so for example, I had this box over here, as I said before. You had the long wavelength mode. Maybe the error here, the size of this error, depends on where I am. Okay, there is the long wavelength mode. Okay, and so in reality, maybe I should write I should write something like this: that sigma square of the error, or that S i S j of the error is some sigma square delta j plus some correction that depends on where I am. Okay. Now remember that. Now, the, all of these things that I am doing in perturbation theory, they are small. Now, these guys are only on large scales and are small, small corrections. So let me just, for the purposes of this, just try to expand as if this was a small, this dependence just linearly in the size of the long wavelength mode, okay? So I can write things like, for example, uh, a coefficient here, sigma square one, and uh, delta j divergence of s of perturbation theory. Okay, this is the same as delta. Or I can write sigma two square di s j plus d j s i minus two thirds delta j divergence of s of perturbation theory. So, um, so now s i j can be something constant, can be something that is modulated by the value of the, this is density, right? This is delta. So the density of the long wavelength mode. I on, the only rule here is that, you know, I need to have something which is a tensor with the right index structure. And, and it can only depend on delta. You can, I cannot put something that depends directly on the gravitational potential, things like that. So I need to learn how to, to write the most general possible dependence with free coefficients, okay? So there are now a bunch of free coefficients. Um, plus dot dot dot, so you can convince yourself that at this low order in derivatives and order in s, these are the only two terms that you can write uh, um, for this dependence. If you go to high order in derivatives or higher order in delta, you can write more things. You have to learn. This is what these papers are about. Learn how to write this kind of thing. What is the most general thing that you can write? But in any case, at the order that we are working, this is the all that you need. And in fact, um, I leave it as an exercise for you to just imagine that this guy, you now plug in here. How did I get this, this delta here? I, I, I replaced this by its expectation value, OK? If you plug in that more complicated formula, you will end up with the at the lowest order with the exact same thing as here, OK? Because what will happen is that uh, this term over here that is already linear in the perturbation theory S, you, you will, you, you will, uh, you will um, expand this exponential to, to the first order in, to the zeroth order in S perturbation theory. And then when you do the Fourier transfer and everything, you just get exactly the same form as this, 
but with a coefficient which is now a linear combination of these three, OK? So this dependence doesn't lead to anything different than this, OK? So the conclusion is that if you are computing the, if you are computing the density out of the perturbation theory motions plus this error, the density that you actually observe in the simulation is a corrected one by things like this. And after you learn to do these things, you know the rules about what kind of corrections there can be. This is the first one, OK? Um, now, the next thing to ask, the next question to ask is the following. Now, if the density that is in the simulation at any given time compared to the perturbation theory one is slightly different, this means that if I were to use this stuff to compute the gravitational potential, the forces would be slightly different from the ones that I was using in perturbation theory, right? Because now the, the density is different. So when I solve Poisson equation, I get a different phi, and I should move the particles a little bit differently, OK? That's true, and you can go, uh, uh, go ahead and, and, and do that. There's two kind of things that are happening. First of all, there will be, if I use this to solve uh, for phi, so Laplacian of phi equals proportional to this delta, you will see that there are two pieces. One that is a completely random force that does, has nothing to do with the perturbation theory, OK? Um, and then there is a, a, a force which looks like the one of perturbation theory, but corrected by this little effect, OK? So when you plug, so let's, for the mo let's forget about this one for the moment. Um, so let's say we take this, we plug it into this, we compute the force, we plug it into the equation of motion for the particles. What we will, decide, what we will find, we will again find that the motions are now corrected from the ones of perturbation theory by some factor. Remember that the, K, the, the, the equations of motion that do not have any K, or that, that just goes along for a ride, right? So then if, if the source is, has corrected like this, if the force has been corrected like this, the displacement of the particles will be corrected by a term like this as well. So, OK, if you, if you do that, you realize that the displacement of the particles, the density that you compute, and so on, they are all affected by this error in this specific way. You all get some multiplication like this, OK? With the parameter, that's slightly different, because if you plug this in into the equation of motion, you would need to integrate this. This probably is a function of time in our universe. The, the error is different now than at redshift 0, at redshift 2, or whatever. So, if you plug that in, you will have to integrate in time this, uh, this error and so on to get what is the error in, in, in the displacement, OK? But it will have more or less the same structure. It's just some, some unknown parameter, OK? Um, so the, the, the conclusion then is that at least if you do this at the lowest order, and then you, you can look at more sophisticated derivations of this in these papers that I alluded to, but the point is that you end up with the following. You end up with a, a per, uh, um, this is the, the total delta. Huh? You, you end up with densities or, or, um, or displacement, depending on what you're interested in. But they are all of the same form. They are the perturbation theory the thing that you've computed multiplied by a factor that starts if you, st if you state at the lowest order in S because S always comes with a K, the lowest order, the power spectrum would be S squared. There would be K squared, sigma squared, something, OK? So they're all like this, OK? Yeah? Just assuming that K dot S is small. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will now show you, I will now show you uh, at some point the, exactly the, the, the size of this error. And, uh, and um, you know, so you can see how big these things are. But yeah, I mean, it will. Yeah, it, this is valid. On, in some sense, the place you you should think of the k at which k dot s k dot s error becomes of order one as the place where perturbation theory failing. Okay, so because now things are mo for for the purposes of of the case that you're interested in, your errors are you know, as big as the k, so you're not going to do anything. So this, of course, is always a theory that is valid on lo large, sufficiently large wavelengths that this error is not so important. Yeah? 
No, this, this, was just a, this was just a number, right? It was just the expectation value of S at every point. So it's just a number. No k dependent. What this perturbation theory is telling you is, in some sense, is fixing for you what are the k dependence of these corrections. That's what we are learning. What we are learning is, even if it's an, an, at least at sufficiently low k, the, the form of the corrections to perturbation theory from the unknown stuff have very definite forms, OK? So, that's, so you learn that it, b, A, you always have an error. B, this error pollutes your stuff in very specified ways, OK? C, I have no idea what the size of this error has to be a free parameter, OK? Um, so this is what, what you do. And um, let me see what else. Uh, any, any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, so, so uh, um, this, this thing is, uh, roughly speaking, around uh, 1 or 2 megaparsecs squared. So, so that, that's the size. So when, when the k becomes comparable to 1, then this is a big thing. So, you, so for, for k of uh, 0.1 is a percent effect. Okay, so, so uh, it will turn out this guy of the order of 1 and megaparsec squared. Okay, so if, if we, we were talking about k's of around 0.1. So at k of 0.1, this correction is a percent, OK? As you go higher k, this correction becomes bigger. Eventually, you would need to keep every term, and this is not very good. But um, if so, and, and this, of course, is where the story about, uh, about gravity just uh, staying more, things staying more or less together is where it's playing. So if perturbation theory took you somewhere, and then the simulation pff, exploded the whole thing everywhere, this s would be very big, and they would screw you up earlier but the thing more or less stays where you put it and even so your error is you know of the size of a few virial radius of the object so that's uh, that's what this is and so as long as you stay far away from that that's okay so that this will be the reason uh, why this perturbation theory will work up to some k of point 0.1 point if you want to do things good to percent, you will see that you will have to stay around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like this, because after that, the things are becoming too big, OK? Yeah? Let, let me just say, yeah, good. So how, what is the relation with the loop corrections, OK? so. Um, so that, that's, I guess, the check. I mean, it obviously, it was going to work, but um, OK. Um, so w the, the way I had motivated this was that, oh, oh there, there's going to be, uh, there, there are mistakes in these loops um, that, um, that uh, come from the UV. I don't know where, where to put them. This is. Uh, you know, a reflection of those mistakes, OK? So what, what, so, um, um, so let's ask the following question. Um, when I do the loop integral and I consider a shell or, or some, some, so the contribution from, from the loop from some high momenta, what, what k dependence does it have, OK? It better be that, so now I discovered that, that this new theory has this free parameter. It better be, or it would be good, if this form of this free parameter is exactly the same, or this form of this term is exactly the same form, the same k dependence, as the potential mistakes from the loops. So then what will happen is that when I compute a loop, I will do the integral up to some lambda or even up to lambda infinity. I will be putting in some mistake. This term will now then be used to take out whatever the mistake of the loop is, and put the actual correct answer, correct motion, OK? So what I'm saying is, on small scales, there are some random motions. There are some true random motions. When you compute the, the small scales with perturbation theory, you get some random stuff. So 
this 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 error has to has to do two things. First, if you want, has to take out whatever the mistake that you're putting in with perturbation theory and replace it for by the right answer. Okay, and so hopefully, when and and in this derivation we saw that if you have a mistake like this, then the correction is like that. Okay, and uh, so hopefully this is the same form that the loop has when you are the, the part of the loop uh, of high momentum so that it can be used to, to renormalize the whole thing. So, so in, a, in other way, for example, if you put a cutoff uh, to the loop, the answer will depend on where you put the cutoff, but this coefficient, you will take it to be uh, cutoff dependence in order to make the answer not depend on the cutoff. But if this has the wrong form, then you're screwed. But it has the right form, as you can see here. The P13, which is the one is related to the fact that I did, I mean, it's almost, one three means I, 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 um, I um, uh, took expectation value on one of the sides. The form of the UV contribution of, of the P13 is K squared P11, which is what you get if you correlate this guy with a delta, you get the delta of perturbation theory, one minus K squared sigma squared. So it's exactly the same. So this term, is, uh, is, uh, has the exact same form. And, and, and so if you look at these papers, that's so, so basically you learn how to write things like this, or what are the, the form, if you even to go to higher loops and so on, you learn how you, you should, uh, the rules for writing the, how these potential corrections might depend on the long modes, and you learn these rules in, 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 su in such a way, these rules work in such a way that any mistake that you put from the loops, there's always one of these free parameters that has the exact same K dependence as the UV part of the loop that to absorb that mistake, okay? But at the lowest order that I'm working on, it's just this one parameter, okay? Uh, then, then there is, uh, then there is the, the part from, if, if you look at the contrib Remember, I show you this P22 almost doesn't depend on the cutoff, depends much little. But how does this? De how is that dependent? It has some particular form, and you can prove. And this I leave you as an exercise: that, uh, that assuming mass and momentum conservation, this the power spectrum of this term has exactly that form to, to fix any problem with the other part of the of the, of the loop. Yeah. Um, so now that I, now that I, um, um, yeah, so anything that would be correlated is, is the same as saying that I take the perturbation theory answer and I modify it in some way. This, if you want, is the correlation coefficient, but I'm putting that so I'm, I'm putting that on this part of the term, not on this guy, okay? So in some sense, this is my definition of S error because anything that correlates with the perturbation theory, I will call this, you can call this some sort of transfer function or something like this. So, um, so perhaps this is a good time to, I, 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 okay, so, so the, the um, that's what these papers are all about. They are about learning how to write this dependence on the, on the, the, the possible statistical properties of this, uh, of this error as a function of the long wavelength mode, how this could be, how they could depend, and carrying it, this through and, and, and seeing the form of the correction in the final delta, the form in the correction of the final S. Okay, that's all there is to it. Um, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Because I would expect that uh, an uncorrelated error can only make it uh, fluffier, not uh, 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 adding uh, some insulation and some variance. Um, yes, so, so, um, well, yeah, okay, so, so, um, so in reality, um, the, 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 way, the, the way it's happening is that, um, let's see. Um, the, 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 um, 
Well, the, 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 it's, it's getting fluffier because, um, because um, in, the, in, in, the, in the perturbation theory, the things are crossing and, and going through. So if you want to do this, uh, if you want this sigma square of, of an error to really be a positive number, you really will need to first stop, so put a cutoff so that you don't, uh, that you don't go through, and then, the, the, so in other words, le, le, let me just, uh, so you, you have all these particles going like this, okay, in the, in the truth. In, uh, in perturbation theory, okay, they cross, both in perturbation theory and the truth. In perturbation theory, they go on for much longer, okay? And in the truth, they just stick. So uh, the, the mistake, you should, if you, if you want to interpret these all as positive numbers and so on, then this guy, you need to stop the mo until before you collapse. And then, the air, you, you, in some sense, you're, first you take out Part of the sigma square needs to be negative if you don't put the cutoff uh, to take out the excess motion from the perturbation theory. And then you need to add the random motion that are really there from the halo that are very small, okay? So, so, um, so if, um, if, um, if you don't put a cutoff, indeed, what you mostly are doing is taking out, so putting a negative. So this would be like a negative. So, um, so for example, that's, uh, that's very clear when you compute P15, for example, you get uh, a super large number. Basically, what you're doing is taking out, basically, the zeroth order thing that you do is just kill the contribution. Like the, 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 the five is one of the terms that you know, takes you like over there, and so you just need to take that part out, and so it's really a negative, uh, a negative. Uh, well, it depends on where you put the cutoff, but um, um, okay. So, um, so let me let me let me um, now now um, think about this in a slightly different so so in a slightly different. Uh, way of thinking about it. Forget about the, these effective theories or whatever. Let's just be very more pragmatic, OK? And say, and say the following. Um, let's think of this simulation box, OK, where I, I have all of these particles. Um, typically, in a simulation, let's just take a random simulation that you can run in some not so big computer, just to give a sense. It's, uh, 500 cube particles, 1,000 cube particles, okay? So it's a lot of particles, okay? So, uh, or if you want a lot of grid cells in this simulation box, okay? So if you think about this S of Q, okay? Let, let, let's, for the, for the okay, let, let me talk about the potential for, for S. So I'm, just so that it's a scale. I don't want to write arrows all the time, so. So S is grad of some phi, some potential, or, or maybe I was calling it phi the gravitational potential. So let, so let me just take the gradient part of the displacement, okay? And so just discuss that so it's a scale. So, um, so this is, if you want, if you think about this, this is a lot of numbers, like you know, 10, 1,000 cube numbers, okay? So you can think of this as a humongous vector. You put it in a vector, okay? <laughs> humongous vector. Okay, so um, now this, the simulation is giving you some humongous vector. The output is a million numbers, or no, a million, or 10 to the 9 or something. No. Okay, so this is the nonlinear answer. Perturbation theory, what are you doing? You're taking your, uh, your initial conditions. Somebody gave you the initial conditions. That is some initial vector, psi 0 of Q, okay, which is all of the displacement, another initial super long vector, okay? And uh, linear theory is just telling you this vector is going to be proportional to this, okay? And then when you do second order perturbation theory, you combine two of these guys to form a new humongous vector. Um, and so you, you have, if you want a set of vectors, psi zero, or maybe linear theory, I call it psi one. Psi one, psi two, psi three, blah, blah, blah. And the question that, that we are trying to figure out is how 
similar how aligned this vector is with these different ones, OK? But perhaps I should just think of these different vectors that I computed in perturbation theory. So for example, psi 2, remember, was some sort of integral of 2 psi 1s with some kernel, OK? So this is some, some and psi 3, some integral of three of them with some kernel, OK? Each of them is one of these vectors. I perhaps can think of this as some sort of basis in which I'm expanding this vector in, OK? And, um, and then I can just ask the question, what, what are the coefficients? Forget about any calculation of the perturbation theory is uh, telling me more or less what's the form of these things and the actual si coefficient here. So if everything was in perturbation theory, it would be 1 plus 1 psi 2 plus 1 psi 3, OK? But let me just say that there is some sort of projection of this thing, OK? Now, uh, the only thing that I want to comment is the fact that these are humongous vectors, and we are, um, we are um, expanding them in just a few numbers. So it's very, it's very clear whether or not, uh, whether or not they are you know, aligned or not aligned. It's a big vector space, OK? Um, so, so let me, so, so I can define some sort of scalar product in which I take two of these vectors. The, the expectation value serves as some sort of scalar product. So psi 1, psi, psi nonlinear is, you know, the projection of the true answer into this particular direction and so on, OK? This basis, if I do it in perturbation theory, these are not an orthogonal basis because psi 1 and psi 3, this is what we were calling p13. So it is not, it's not 0, right? But I can, if you want, orthogonalize it. So psi 3, I, I put everything, whatever it looks like of 3 that looks like 1, I, I put it in there, OK? So you can think of, the, of all of this as, uh, as um, there is some there is some humongous vector. I'm trying to decompose it into pieces. And these pieces, I have some template shapes in space that are these uh, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. And so I'm asking the question, uh, how, how similar is this map in this box in the final answer with an expansion you know, in terms of these vectors? And then there will be something extra this error thing that I will never, even if I add a lot of these terms, I mean, you can clearly see that the, the vector space is so large that, I mean, there's a lot of room for error to look in a different direction that is not proportional to one of these three few three vectors in a 10 to the 9, OK, in a dimensional space. So, so, so then I can just ask the question, how, you know, how are, what is the size, these are well-defined question. what is A1, A2, A3, and then I can compare with perturbation theory, which tells me, for example, that this A1 is 1 minus some coefficient times k, or plus some coefficient plus k squared, I can do this, okay? Or I can even say, forget about this, I will just ask the question, what is the best A1 of k that I can put here to minimize the difference? I just minimize psi nonlinear minus this linear combination of ai, psi i, what are the best psi i's? It's easy to measure because, again, it's at 100 million dimensional space. So the, I have plenty of signal to noise to figure out how, the, how, how these ai's are. Um, and so I can just measure them, and perhaps I forget about any more and, 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 uh, and, um, and just measure it this way. So I will just show you, and this will give you a sense of, uh, of uh, and, and uh, the, the reason to do this is that um, rather than comparing the output of this perturbation theory, the average power spectrum that you compute with perturbation theory to the power spectrum that you had in the, in the simulation, what I'm telling you is that what I'm trying to do is compute in this actual, in, I take a given box, okay, of, of of, that I'm going to run with the simulation. And then I ask in that box, I compute the actual displacement in for that random initial conditions that I expect from perturbation theory. So I don't have, I'm not comparing averages. I don't have any kind of cosmic variance. I ask in this box how well that I can do. That's the question, OK? And so I just uh, can either expand what perturbation theory tells me or this EFT that allows me to do 
uh, uh, tells me to put this free coefficient, I can fit for this one free coefficient, or I can measure all of these quantities from the simulation. And, uh, and uh, so, so, so then I can look at two, in, in this plot there are two possibilities, two, two things that are being shown. One of them is how, well, how good the power spectrum of the final answer compares to the power spectrum that what one has computed in this way. So one is P final minus P of the perturbation theory of P nonlinear, or let me just, P, P nonlinear over the P of the perturbation theory minus one. Okay, so, so how, how similar are the two power spectrum? Perhaps it's the opposite. Uh, P mod, it was the other way around. P perturbation theory over P nonlinear minus one. This is one, uh, one sense of the error. Or the other one is just to look at this, this error, this psi error, and just do the power spectrum of the error, okay? How big is the error, okay? The difference, so if you want, one of them is psi of the, mo it has to do with the psi of the model, squared minus psi of the, of the uh, perturbation theory squared. This is how similar the power spectrums are. But a much more stringent thing that even, this one, even if I get the phases wrong, but they have the same amplitude, it looks the same. But another more, uh, more stringent thing is to do psi model minus psi nonlinear. Uh, non so the full thing squared, okay? So this is just the size of the errors. If, even if the phases are wrong, it will show up, okay? That's the, that's the plot on the, on the right. So that's the, this, the, 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 the difference. And, and this curve, so now we can start seeing how good this thing can do. So um, this is this error power spectrum divided by the nonlinear power spectrum. This is 1%. Okay, this line is 1%. This is for, this is all in Lagrangian. Linear theory, this one would be, let's look, one loop, and this one is the two loop, okay? So, um, um, so you, you can see that, uh, um, at, at least for people that compare with, uh, with uh, simulations, usually, you know, because of cosmic variance, one never can compare things uh, you know, to this kind, I'm, tell, I'm saying the error is 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, a very small difference, okay? This I can only do because I'm comparing in a given box. But anyhow, you can see how well it can do. You can see that in, in this region like this, you can get errors, differences that are super small, okay? So you are doing very well with this thing after you fix this, this stuff. Um, and uh, and you, you are more or less getting to 1%. Uh, the, the difference is around 1%, around k of 0.1 or 0.2, okay? Um, and here you can see, again, the same thing. So here is just the, the, the comparison of, of the power spectrum. This would be linear theory. This normal linear theory. This would be uh, the... the, um, the so this, this is, remember I was showing you that in the standard perturbation theory, when you start adding loops, things do not particularly get better. These are the answers for linear theory, um, one loop, and two loops of the standard calculation. This fixing by adding this uh, uh, k-square term is the green line, okay? And you can see, I have no cosmic variance, so I can see really very tiny, you know, it's super flat, this thing. Okay, so I, I, this is you know, fractions of a percent. So I can, I, 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 this really captures what's going on and, and it's much better than even the two loops without the fixing, okay? This is one loop only in the EFT with this k-square term, okay? Um, and also I have, uh, what, what, we have so many, the, the, there's no ambiguity in the measuring of, or not too much ambiguity in the measurement of CS because we can, measure things on, on, on large scales and everything. This approximation of k-square is very good because we don't, we don't have to worry about the, the cosmic variance or the fact of sample variance that I have a finite number of simulations is not entering. So even I can go to low, sufficiently low scales that, that this, uh, 
expansion in k squared should be very, very good. And so, um, OK. Yeah? Oh, the vorticity of the of the displacement. Yes. So I'm. Com I'm. Yeah. Great. So in in the case of uh, uh, of Lagrangian perturbation theory, um, this displacement has both a gradient piece and a curl piece. Um, I put plots here only for the uh, gr uh, gradient piece, just for simplicity. But um, you you. You, have, you can also look at the curl. The curl in perturbation theory starts at third order, so it's a small thing. But I, didn't, I don't have it, in, but I can show you. Um, yeah, it, you, you can do it, and you, it's, it's been included. We looked at it, but I just glossed over it, but, uh, or didn't mention it at all. But yeah, so um, you, you, can, you can look how well, it, how well you're doing, and so on. And, the, the, it's not a different conclusion. I didn't have. I don't have the plots to show you. But I have it in a paper. But... No. Um, yeah. After the thing is nonlinear. Yes. But on these scales that I'm showing here, um, it's a, it, it, it's it's quite small. Okay. It, it it will start making corrections at the size of. Uh, even a little below the, the if I compute that, so here I'm, I'm computing the, diver, the, the, the divergence, the power spectrum of the divergence of the displacement. So this curl piece, I put it to, you know, it, it, I project it out on purpose for these plots. Now you can ask the question of, uh, of uh, how much, if I compute the density, how much, uh, does this curl piece contributes to the density power spectrum if I go to one loop, two loop, and so on. So at one loop, it doesn't contribute. Then it starts to contribute. But um, it's, yeah, I don't have the plot to show you, but it's not such a big effect. On small scales, yes. On small scales, it's, for example, if I look at the, at the displacement uh, around k of 0.6 or something, the, the curl part and the gradient part are more or less comparable. They are the same order of magnitude. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The way I got the the way I got the um, the um, so what is the what is this? So how do I get the, so if you want the sigma square, so if we go back to the formula that I had, I said psi nonlinear, I'm saying that it's going to be A1 plus psi1 times A2, which are, I'm thinking about this as expanding it in some vector space or whatever, psi3 plus blah, 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 blah. So what is the A1? I can measure A1 by doing psi nonlinear, psi, the correlation psi nonlinear over psi 1, psi 1, OK? So I, I multiply the, the simulation thing by the psi 1. The, the, so the simulation has some particular shape of psi as a function of x, OK? Psi as a function of x. And psi 1 is some other thing, OK? So I multiply them together, integrate, and then I divide by psi 1, psi 1. This is a 1. I can measure this in Fourier space as a function of k. and it will look like 1 plus some coefficient or minus k squared, blah, blah, blah. So I'm, I, I go at sufficiently low k, and I, I see what this is. Okay? So this A1, if you, I can show you in the, in the plot. Uh, OK, so even here, I think I have it. So, uh, so if you just take this ratio, you've measured uh, A1 and. Uh, and uh, you can see in perturbation theory, um, so you measure it. You measure a 1 as a function of k, and it's, uh, it's uh, the blue line, OK? And it should be given by, um, OK, it's a, li it's a little bit, if I just multiply by psi 1 here, because psi 3 and psi 5, they correlate with a 1, 
they will contribute to this, okay? So, I'll, so um, perhaps I should just define this as perpendicular, just a perpendicular part, and so. Anyway, but so from, from, from trying to match this curve, I get the value of, uh, of this alpha, okay? And uh, so that's, that's what it is. So you go to sufficiently, so if you want, uh, is the difference, the alpha, if you, look, you go to sufficiently low k, you look at this, and if you didn't put the alpha, you would get this, and the measurement is the blue, okay? So this is the measurement of alpha, okay? And as you can see, it's, it's, it's a parabola thingy, and, uh, or the difference between these two things is a parabola, and uh, that gives you the value of alpha, okay? And then I take that value of alpha, and, uh, and see with that value of alpha how small, the, um, how small this difference is, okay? And that's the other plot over there. Yeah. Yes. 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 Or you look at a different redshift. Yes. So, or in, in fact, presumably, um, or I would say that in reality. What, what one should do to when, when one compares to data is to fix this coefficient with the data itself. Forget about the simulation. So you just know that uh, the density it has this particular form. There's an unknown parameter, which is, uh, you can think of it as a new nuisance cosmological parameter that we don't know. Or you have from simulation some order of magnitude of what it could be, okay? And so, um, that's another free parameter that is, goes with your uh, free parameters of your cosmology that you're interested in. So for example, imagine that you're trying to constrain the neutrino masses, and they change the power spectrum in some way, OK? But in your prediction, there is, in the, in the theoretical prediction, there is a unknown coefficient, this sigma square. So you're doing measurements, various measurements, and they, they, your theory depends on the neutrino mass and on the sigma square. And you need to see if with the data that you have, you can tell them apart. The sigma square cannot be anything. It will be, have some range from, you can get it from the simulation, so you can estimate it in. But there's some range, an uncertain range here, and you have to let the sigma float and see if, if it's good enough, even with, if the, your data is good enough, that even with that, allowing for that uncertainty, you can tell the two effects apart. And you will be able to do it if the other effect is not just a parabola in K, okay? For example, the neutrinos have some other shape. So in that case, you have some hope. Or you, also, this parameter, I mean, the other thing that this kind of story, this, this paper tells you is um, how this parameter might enter in, in other statistics. So this error that I have will enter also when I compute the bispectrum, when I compute. So th those coefficients are somewhat related, although there are more for when you compute the bispectrum. So it's a little bit not, not obvious if you're going to gain or not. But in principle, there are, um, there are every, these, these parameters enter in more than one observable. So you might imagine measuring a bunch of statistics and, and seeing, leaving these unknown parameters floating. If you have some good sense from the simulation, you will, the, the, the range will be narrower. Uh, and also the cosmo and cosmological thing. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, maybe yes, maybe no. So it depends on 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 uh, on uh, on what you are trying to do. So if you have a phenomenological model that uh, that is you know captures everything as good as this, I think it's probably. For a practical point of view, there's no difference. Um, um, but what this gives you is first, you, you, you um, first is doing very well, OK? Uh, so it is capturing, because you're understanding what's going on, 
your, your, uh, your shapes of these corrections are, you're getting them what they are, right? And so the parameter, but perhaps you could have invented this phenomenological model just, or something that looks very just, in, in, at the end of the day, it's not, you, if, if I start thinking about this as, um, as just free coefficient in which I'm expanding this, and it, I, I, I know that at low k the effect is going to be very small, then this guy, I, I'm Taylor expansion, okay? And this is what it is. So at the end of the day, the model, you just take your perturbation theory and put some coefficients and you do some Taylor expansion, it's probably okay. Um, now, um, however, um, yeah, so, so, but this, this, uh, um, this gives you more understanding. It also gives you how these coefficients will depend. These coefficients are doing two things. They are also fixing your perturbation theory, so they are dependent on your perturbation theory. So you also learn how you need to change this if you go to higher orders because of, 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 of the new terms that you're adding. So you, you, or, or if you change the cutoff of your integrals and so on. So you have a lot more information. Now, at the end of the day, if it's going to be some shape, maybe that's good. Okay. In any case, I think it, what it adds is some understanding, and I usually like to understand the thing. So, um, okay, so I will stop here. Yeah.